All right, High Rollers, what a treat this is. He is a world-famous gambler, and when it comes to craps and throwing dice, he is a legend. The number one dice controller in the world, listed in the top ten gamblers all time, and that is quite a list, folks. The man with the golden arm, they call him the Dominator. That's obviously a play on his first name, but also because he has dominated casino craps over the years, dominated the dice, winning, to my guess, and this is just a guess, it may be a lot more, but hundreds of thousands of dollars. He owns and operates GoldenTouchCraps.com, and he's been featured on numerous television shows, including the famed Breaking Vegas. Dominic Loriggio joins us. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks for being our high roller today. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for uh, giving us this time and talking about it. I love, I love talking about dice control craps and you know, again, gambling, although I say, like, uh, you play a lot of poker, you know, you were, we're advantage players, we're not gamblers, you know, we're playing games that we know we have an edge at, and uh, that's a lot of fun. Well, it's interesting that you say that. I had this question down the list, but I'll bring it up now. I firmly believe there is a difference between advantage play and, you know, cheating. You know, I'm wondering if you yeah. could address this, because... You've devoted a life to this endeavor, practiced for hours and hours at controlling the dice. Have you suffered any negative stigma for that, for controlling the dice? Have you been labeled a cheat? And if so, I mean, what do you say to that? I have been labeled a cheat, you know, uh, by casinos, actually. Uh, you know, I'm banned in about 75% of all the casinos in Las Vegas for not only uh, blackjack, because I started off as a blackjack con card counter about 40 years ago, that's really uh, how, you know, my whole thing started, uh, as well as craps, and I'm banned in the whole state of Mississippi, I'm banned in the whole state of Louisiana. So, yeah, uh, there's nothing to, you can't handle it, you know, I look at it when they, whenever I get banned, is basically it's their baseball, it's their glove, and if they don't want me to play, then, you know, I can't fight City Hall. But, you know, people out there think that it's cheating, you know, people think that Blackjack Car County is cheating. In fact, TV shows, you know, whenever they show a card counter on a show, they make it seem like the guy or the lady is a is a cheat, and you're not. I mean, you're not bringing an apparatus out into the casino. You're using your mind, uh, and, the, you know, that's totally not cheating. And in my case, with craps, I'm using a physical skill that I've practiced. And again, I'm following the rules of the game, hitting the back wall, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's not cheating, but, uh, you know, people will consider it that way. But I just kind of laugh it off and say, no, man, I'm a, an advantage player, and you can beat this game too if you tried. It's interesting about advantage play because here the casinos are with all the built-in odds. They've got the advantage. You're following the rules. You practice. I mean, you devote it, your entire life to this, and you start winning, and they have the right because it's a business to shut you out. What do you feel about all that? It's kind of an interesting relationship between these advantage players in the casino. It is an interesting relationship. You know, in the in the States, it's it's called the innkeeper law. And because they serve liquor and they serve it, uh, you know, at the tables for free, uh, basically they can ask anybody to leave for and not give any kind of reason. There's no, uh, you can't say, well, you're going against me because of my race or my color or anything like that, they serve liquor and they can ask people to leave. And so that's what they go by. That's the the reason why they can do that. Now there's, you know, there's a couple states in the country, in the U.S., that you can't do that to, New Jersey for one, and that is because when they started gambling or put up casinos in, in New Jersey, you know, blackjack car counters actually took it all the way to the Supreme Court. They didn't make their bylaws, the gaming regulations, according to Las Vegas, and the uh, New Jersey Supreme Court ruled that uh, advantage play is not illegal. Interestingly enough, same thing happened in Louisiana just last year. Uh, about two months before I was banned from every casino, in, uh, two months after, before I was banned from every casino in Louisiana, they then passed uh, the law that says that you cannot be banned in Louisiana for advantage play. The problem is is that because I was <laughs> banned two months prior, uh, I'm still banned. So it's kind of an interesting uh, type of thing there. But uh, that's the reason why they can do it, and there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, a person like myself, unless they, you know, uh, start 
bullying you and putting their hands on you and stuff like that. But that doesn't happen anymore. You know, in the olden days in Las Vegas, I was bullied. You know, they could uh, take you and uh, throw you out. And, uh, you know, I've had some rough situations take place with me in, in Las Vegas back, you know, 25 years. 30 years ago, but uh, that's not the way anymore. Usually when it happens to me, they say, hey, Dom, I'm a big fan. I'm sorry, upstairs decided your game is way too good for us. You can't play here anymore. Yeah, that's interesting, that's right? Because it's like a compliment. They're saying to you, you're too good. We don't want your business. Yeah, you know, and I get that from my students, too. Like, I wish I'm, you know, I wish I can get as good as you and get banned. And I, I you know, I say to them, look, at it. it's not a badge of honor uh, because you can't play there anymore. You know, it might be a casino that's very conducive to what you do in blackjack, good card, good penetration under games, you know, good rules in craps, tables that are uh, real good for what I do. All of a sudden, I'm banned uh, from that particular casino, let's say Bellagio, which I'm banned from, that has great blackjack games, great craps games, their tables are great. I can't play there anymore, so it's not a badge of honor for me. You know, that's a, t- that's a game I want to be able to play at, at that particular casino, uh, versus, you know, if I was banned from uh, oh, the Venetian, well, I was banned from Venetian, <laughs> uh, <can't, laughs> MGM, let's say, as an example, although I am in their, in their computer, but just talking about the particular casino, their tables are not as conducive, their blackjack games are not as, con- are, are not as good. Uh, so it wouldn't bother me, you know, if I got banned over there. So, you know, you talk about Louisiana and you talk about Mississippi, you know, these are great games in the South for what I do. And so that's really, uh, you know, really does bother me. I mean, Tunica used to be an ATM machine for me back in the old days, you know, when I needed to pay a tuition for my daughter in Catholic school, you know, I'd go down there for uh, two or three days, you know, and come back home, go to the priest and hand him four grand for the whole uh, year's tuition, and I'm done. So, you know, those things, those days are long gone now for me. How did you get involved in craps? You know, personally, uh, you know I play poker. I don't play any other games in the casino with the exception of the odd craps game. I do that sometimes with the family and friends because I love the atmosphere around the table, especially when it's yeah. crowded, you know, and lively. I expect to lose, though. I budget for it but I consider it entertainment. Uh, when did you fall in love with this game? Well, like I said, I started off as a blackjack card counter, actually at teams, uh, as it went on and on. And I did it because when I moved to New York from Buffalo and I worked for Barney's and managed their international department, I needed to make some extra money from my uh, wife and daughter. My uh, wife couldn't work and my daughter was young. And I took a job at a gas station and because I loved cars. I worked on cars as a kid. After about a month and a half, uh, I was by myself at the gas station. I worked a midnight shift. I got robbed at gunpoint. And I came uh, back home, scared you know, as, as all hell because I really thought I was a goner. And I said, you know, what are we going to do? I need to make some extra money. And I said, well, you know, I got a degree in math and I love cards. I'm going to learn how to count cards and become a blackjack card counter so for six months i practiced i could count down a deck of cards in 11 seconds no mistake wow and back then I, i'd go to a, i'd go to atlantic city on a day trip uh taking a bus they gave you you know i forgot what it was somewhere around five or ten bucks but you got food allowance and you got some coupons and stuff like that and you could back count and um i'd sit back and you know i started off you know with a very small bankroll i saving money in those six months, probably about 200 bucks. And I'm going back now almost 40 years. But I'd come back home with 40 bucks, 50 bucks, 60 bucks in cash. And at that time, back 40 years ago, that was a hell of a lot of money. That was a week's worth of groceries, a uh, full tank of gas, and maybe a pizza on Friday night. So that's how it started, how I started in this whole thing. But as that game of blackjack became, I'm not going to say harder to beat, but where your edge became smaller and smaller because of the rule changes in the game, no doubling after split, just different rule changes. I began to look at craps as a game that was basically a physics problem. Uh, You know, my minor is in physics, so I looked at it as just it's a moving projectile in the air, and I I, I think there's a way of beating this game. So I had my dad, God rest his soul, build me a little practice rig, and I started playing with dice, started playing with the sets, started 
thinking it through as a physics problem. What does a moving projectile go through when it's in the air? And so came up with a grip that would put revolutions on the dice and landing and, and that sort of thing. And then looked at the edge of the game and said, well, you know, it's not just the, it's not just the physics of the throw and trying to avoid the seven, but the betting of it has to be important as well. So, you know, to beat the game, the way I play the game, is you only got to reduce the show of a seven one less time out of 36 rolls. And with proper betting and with some practice, then that game can be beat. If you just re- remove the seven out of 36 rolls 0.23% of the time, you're going to gain an edge over the casino of 1.8. Now, today... In blackjack, even as an expert card counter, you'd be lucky if you get 1.5 edge because of penetration, because of rules. So at 1.8, man, you're better than even a blackjack card counter. Now, if you can get even a little bit better with some practice, which is easy enough, uh, you can get edges in craps like I have, you know, high 8%, almost 10% edge when I'm throwing the dice. And that's huge. I mean, that's just huge money. So uh, that's how it started. That's how I got started in it. I I just looked at it as another game when when blackjack became a game where my edge got to be so you know smaller and smaller. Uh, I wanted to get another game in there that uh, that I could beat. Real quick, uh, you mentioned blackjack. I know there's a lot of interesting things going on with blackjack nowadays. Especially, I mean, there's even a national blackjack day because they want uh, three to two odds. A lot of these casinos are going to six to five. I mean, they just nickel and dime you. Right. In fact, I got a text just the other day from uh, a friend of mine, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of what the casino was in Las Vegas. But, you know, it used to be the six to five game was only a single deck game. Maybe some double deck games. Uh, you know, Bally's has had a double deck game with six to five. But this particular casino in Las Vegas, and it's a popular casino. I can look at my phone and get the the text of it. They're they're playing an eight deck game at six to five, uh, and that is just absolutely like being a, a crook when it comes to you know the player in the casino trying to get every nickel and dime out of these people, and that's what's what's really happening with the casinos today. Uh, You know, they're all corporations, and there are are a lot of pencil pushers that are just looking for every tenth of a percentage point versus the olden days when you had people like the Wynn and uh, uh, Steve Wynn and and Binion, where they realized that you had to have some winners because if you had some winners, they would go back home and say, hey, I went to the Golden Nugget, played some blackjack, and I came home with $1,500. And they'd say that to a friend. And now the friend, when he goes to Las Vegas or she goes to Las Vegas, let me stay at the uh, Golden Nugget. You know, Dom uh, won over there. Let me go over there. They realized that you have to have some winners. Today, they don't want any winners. You know, and it's, and it's because, you know, gambling is not the biggest um, attraction anymore in Las Vegas. You know, now, the, you know, in the last 10 years, for the last 10 years, Las Vegas has made more money, makes more money on their resort fees, their shows, their dinners, and all that good stuff than they do with all the gaming tables. And that's a complete reversal from before 10 years ago. And uh, so, you know, when they do have a gambler or they, when people come in there now, they're not really coming there to really play. They're coming in with their wife or their friends, and they're going to take a show, and they're going to do this or that and watch and look at all the beautiful casinos and maybe play for an hour or two. And they go there and they think, you know, um, uh, if I lose the money, I lose the money. I have some fun. I look at it and say, you know, losing has never been fun for me. And even if you go there and just look into play a little bit, why not uh, read a book? Why not learn a little bit before you go? And winning is the most fun. Take some money from them as well. I'll tell you what, goldentouchcraps.com is a great resource for all of that stuff. We're going to talk about that a bit later, but it's interesting about Vegas. Everybody yeah. I talk to, you know, I've got a trip coming up there in February, and everyone says the same thing. You know, it's just not the same. They're not catering nope. to the gambler anymore, and I'm wondering nope. what the long term impact of that's going to be. I, I think that it's not going to, it hasn't hurt them. You know, it used to be, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for 40 years. I never told people, except for my wife, 
that I was doing this, that I'd go to Atlantic City or go to Las Vegas. Why? Because friends and relatives would look at me like, you know, I was the bent nose guy. You know, what is he, you know, a gambler? What is this? What's this all about? Nowadays, it's perfectly all right for people to say, I'm going to Las Vegas on a vacation. I mean, the whole attitude about going to a casino has completely changed because of the shows, because of the uh, beautiful casinos. It's become a, a tourist attraction, not just going there to gamble. So I don't, I don't think that it's really going to affect them. Obviously, it hasn't. They're, you know, very, very successful doing what they're doing. Great shows, and there are great shows, and there is great restaurants. But that's not what Vegas is all about. I mean, there used to be, you know, great shows as well when you went to see Frank Sinatra or Dean Martin and, uh, and all those guys like that. I mean, you still had good shows, but you played. I mean, you went there to gamble. That's the reason why you went. Nowadays, it's a vacation. You bring your kids. You go into casinos now. You see people walking through the casino and stro- with their strollers and their kids. And you say, what the heck are you doing? You know, it's fascinating because as you're talking, I'm thinking about my trip in February. And I usually go there to play poker. I go there solo. But I'm going this time with my girlfriend. And we're going <laughs> to watch my uh, my niece in a dance competition. And there's no <laughs> poker on the agenda. And I, I can't believe it, you know? Yeah, there you go. You know, you can do that. You can say, I'm going to Vegas and to have some, uh, to go watch a show and to see my niece. Never could say that 30 years ago, man. People would look at you like you were a degenerate gambler. (laughs) You got that right. Yeah. Now, I know you give seminars on the subject. I'm not asking for a free one. You've already alluded, you've already alluded to it before, but I do want to talk about dice control. See, I have this system. I put the dice together with the two fours at the top facing me. I shake them together, I say something positive because I want positive vibes, and then I pray and fire, and I take it that's not what you do. What that you did say, though, uh, positive thoughts. You know, I'd never write it in a book, but I do believe, as uh, the old saying goes, we only use 10% of our brain. And, uh, you know, that we can, we can sometimes uh, make things, I don't, I'm not going to say make things happen, but positive thoughts and stuff like that is pretty fantastic and that's what the craps table is all about you know and a, and a just as a side note you know as a blackjack player you're playing against the the dealer not the players next to you i mean if you win that doesn't mean the player next to you is going to win uh although you know if the dealer busts and everybody's happy that sort of thing but it's really a one-on-one game versus craps 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 is a team game i mean if you're playing the to do the positive side of the game, which 95% of the players play at at a craps game, if if, uh, the player wins, everybody wins. And so it really becomes a rah-rah type of thing, and that's what's so exciting about that game. Uh, And, you know, come on, shooter. And so having positive thoughts, I think, are really great. But, you know, putting the dice together like you are talking about, Derek, is pretty important. But shaking them is is ridiculous. Even uh, <laughs> uh, if you just put hard ways all the way around and you just grab them and instead of toss, instead of shaking them, but throw them in the air with a little bit of an arc and maybe with a little bit of backspin, if you can do that, and I think you'd be able to, try to hit the same spot all the time and you'll wind up having repeating numbers. And what you want to do then is, as far as betting is concerned, is you want to become a come better. Uh, you don't want to just place the six and the eight. Um, first off, that has a net negative edge of one and a half percent. As soon as you put the money out on the table, you're, you're down one and a half percent. When you put a, a, a come bet out, you're at a positive on that very next roll of one and a half percent. So you have a positive edge right there when you first put that edge out. But then if you, if you don't throw a 7 or 11, which gives you that positive edge, and it goes to a number, let's say it goes to the 5, and you take one time odds on that number, you're bringing the edge of that bet down to 0.87, below 1%. That's why you will never hear a craps dealer say to the table, does anybody want a come bet? Now, they're going to say, does anybody want a hard way? Does anybody want a C&E? Does anybody want this, that, and everything else? But you'll never hear them say to the table, does anybody want to come bet? Why? Because it's the best bet you can make. Because if you go with two-time odds on that thing, you're bringing that edge down below 
a half a percentage point. That is phenomenal, just with two time odds. So you're pretty much playing a 50 50 game if you're a come better. Now, if you pick the dice up and set hard ways, and you try to loft them gently, not whip them down the table, but loft them with some backspin and try to hit the same spot all the time, you're going to find that you're going to begin to get repeating numbers. So that five, I'm going to throw, throw it again, and I'm a winner. And all of a sudden, the game becomes a game that is totally beatable. And with a little bit of practice, it can really be beatable. See, this is very interesting because I well, realize you now... I remember one thing. Uh, not to interrupt you. Yeah. Craps is the only game in the casino where the casino is actually saying to the player, here's the dice, put them in your hands, and beat me. As a card counter, and even as a poker player, you can have the edge knowing you have an edge with the hand you have. But whatever the next turn card is on the turn or on the river, that is totally not in your control. That can change the whole game. Same thing, you know, as a curve counter. I can have an edge, meaning that they, you know, right now I have a high count. There are a lot of high cards left in the deck. But it's still the flip of the card. I can get a 16, and the guy next to me gets the 21 blackjack because it's the flip of the card. Craps is, here's the dice, throw them. As long as you follow the rules of the game, you can, you know, beat me. There isn't another game in the casino that you could get as big of an edge at as craps when you become a dice controller. You've got control with the dice in your hand, and you thought to yourself, hey, if I put enough practice into this, I can beat this game. The thing to me is you have to hit that back wall, and that says it's not easy. And I like what you talked about physics. You're basically trying to limit the rotation and limit the distance of the bounce. Yeah, you know, in any moving projectile, there, in, without getting too boring, Any moving projectile goes through six degrees of freedom, it's called. And what you're trying to do with dice control is eliminate three of those degrees of freedom. And you do that by putting revolutions on the dice, which uh, creates centrifugal force, which keeps the dice on axis. You're you're throwing them at at a 45-degree angle, which is what you want to do to try to aim any kind of anything. When you shoot a, a cannon in war... All that is taken in consideration, the the air movement and how high that bullet has to go to come down, straight down on your target. And the same thing happens, you know, with the, with the spin and the revolutions that we're trying to do. Now, if you can do that consistently, meaning hit the same spot, put the same amount of revolutions on it, throw them at the same height all the time, even with the rubber pyramid, the dice are going to react the same way. And that's how you get those repeating numbers, which is what the game is all about. It's not making your point. It's not throwing a five and trying to make the five. The name of the game is to avoid the seven. Uh, one of my instructors, a perfect example in Shreveport, when we used to be able to play, when I used to be able to play there, you know, held the dice for almost an hour, established a point of four, never made the four held the dice for an hour and just kept on throwing number after number after number. Four was an outlier. Wow. And it just stood there. So the name of the game is is avoiding the seven. And you can do that by practicing dice control. And you don't have to really avoid it that uh, that much. And uh, look at them. It's, it's on your side. I mean, with proper betting, you got this game beat. Yeah, a lot of muscle memory in the throw. Let's talk Absolutely. about let's talk about the betting because as you were describing some of the bets there with the come bets, I, I'm sitting here thinking I'm doing this all wrong. I'm there for entertainment. Yeah. I put it on the six and eight, and that's it yeah. because I, I'm just there yeah. for the vibe. But that's not right. I, I'm just starting to realize that I, I'm not doing it right. No, well, because you know, as soon as you put the six and eight out, you got a negative one and a half percent. That's like going to the to a bank. Handing the bank a hundred dollar bill and one and depositing it, and one second later saying to the bank, "I want to withdraw my hundred dollars," and they only give you ninety eight dollars back. <laughs> and they say, and you say, "What the hell's going on? You held it for thirty seconds." Yeah, that's how much it's cost you. So as soon as you put that bet out, it's costing you that one and a half percent. If you put out a come bet, as soon as you put that come bet out, you're at a positive one and a half percent because the very next roll could be a seven. Uh, especially on a random roller, let's say, could be a seven, which is going to show more than any other uh, number uh, on the dice. That's a winner on the comeback. Or it could be an 11. 
that's going to be a winner on that very next row on that comeback. But now if those two numbers don't show, and it does go to that number five, and the number comes up as a five, well, by taking odds on, on that number, because the odds are going to be paid in what is called true odds. They're going to give you what they should give you when a five is shown on that odds bet. So even though now the come bet, once it goes to a number, is carrying a 1.4% edge against you, instead of just being $10 on that 1.4, we're now with one-time odds taking $20 against it, and that brings the edge down. Like I said, it brings the edge down to 0.87 just with one-time odds. If you take two-time odds, you're bringing it back down to below a half a point. Right Now, at a half a point, you know, you don't have to be very good to beat the game. And, you know, as I say to people who take my seminar, even if you never learn the throw, if you just do this betting, you're going to be a much more profitable player because you're bringing the edge of the casino down to almost nothing. So if you get a little lucky today, you're going to be a winner. And if you're not that lucky, you're not going to lose as much as you used to lose because of the edge, the casino edge. You know, people that place the five or place the nine, you know, that's a 4% edge against you. 4%. That's like giving them 100 bucks at the bank and coming back and only give, taking $96 when you ask to withdraw it. Right. You know, so... You want to be a come better when you're playing this game, and you want to set the dice and just throw them in a gentle way, trying to throw it the same way all the time. And I'll tell you, when you go there and you go to your casino that you're going to be staying at, you give it a shot, and I promise you, I'm telling you, you're going to see it go even better. I'm going to and do that. And uh, on a random roller, you know, we ad- we advocate on our website, Golden Touch Crafts. You can see a video, or actually on YouTube channel, Golden Touch Crafts. You can see the video on the five count. That's how you want to bet on a random roller. Somebody who's not, who's just picking the dice up and whipping them. You know, you can't beat the game with any kind of a mathematical system. There is no system to beat the game because, like you said, they all have a negative edge. You know, the only way to beat the game is by learning to control the dice. But what the five count does, it's a way of eliminating shooters. And with the five count, we've taken that to uh, the math test, meaning that we had a uh, professor of, of math at Boston University. He's passed away now, God rest his soul, Don Catlin. But he did 500 billion simulations, rolls. And it proved and showed that by utilizing the five count, we've eliminated 57% of all the shooters at the table. Hmm. By just waiting five rolls, basically, you'll eliminate 57% of the shooters at the table. So you're not making a bet on 57% of the shooters. Gotcha. So your money is only at rest 43% of the time. Those two things, utilizing the five count when you're playing the game of craps, throwing the dice in a controlled way, trying to throw them in a controlled way when you're throwing them, and then you utilizing come betting is going to make the game an entirely different game for you. It'll, even if, like I said, if you never learn dice control, you're going to become a more a profitable player if you play the game of craps. That's, I'm going to try that, and I do appreciate that. Some simple tips right there, and I like it. Going there in February, I'm going to have to let those dice fly. I want to tell you about the first time I ever played craps. I was at the win playing poker, and I took a break, I wandered over to the craps table. It was busy. And I plunk some chips down on don't pass. I was standing right beside the shooter, and he looked at me and said in a serious, stern voice, I'll be rolling for an hour, kid. That's a terrible bet. And it always yeah. stuck with me. You know, we talked about the positive vibes early. Is that a bad bet, uh, the positivity aside? The positivity aside, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the thing that most don't players don't understand. And there are, a lot, you know, there are don't players out there that play the don't. They'll say, well, you know, if I play the don't, I'm, I'm like the casino. You know, nobody's going to keep on rolling forever and ever and ever. Well, maybe you're right, but it's all math, people. It's all math, and you got to learn how to throw the math right back in the casino's face. If you put your money on the pass line, the negative edge on that $10 pass line bet is a negative 1.4. If you put the money on $10 on the don't pass, the edge of the casino is 1.41. There is no difference in basically a hundredth of a percentage point. There is basically no difference 
in Casino Edge against the player, whether you're a, a do player or a don't player, none, if, none whatsoever. The difference being, it goes back to the psychology at the table. Nobody likes a don't player. Right. Because everybody is playing, most people are playing the do. Most players, most people want, you know, the shooter to roll for an hour, like that guy said to you. So the idea behind, you know, well, people are not going to roll for an hour, and if I'm a don't player, well, yeah, I've, you know, look at, I've knocked don't players out like crazy. I mean, I when I used to be able to play at Bellagio, I remember, you know, playing, going up to a table, and a guy buys in for 20 grand, takes out a marker for 20 grand, and starts playing a $500 come bet with max odds. And the dealer said to him, fella, uh, don't come, he, he was playing. Dealer said to him, hey, guy, you know, you don't want to bet against this guy. Well, you know, to make a long story short, within 15 minutes, you know, he was walking away, broke with his tail between his legs. <laughs> so, you know, you know, as a dice controller like myself, when I see a don't player, I want to do that because it's just not the game. The game is, you know, let's let's try to be, let's try to have the whole table win money. But the going back to the math, it's really all math. The math is identical whether or not you're a don't player or a pass line player. There is no difference. So why play the don't? Why make that, especially if you're going to be a dice controller or try to control the dice? You know, you don't want to be uh, somebody who's on the don't, then all of a sudden you're sitting there setting and trying to throw them in a lofty way. You know, you got people looking at you thinking, you know, what the hell's going on with this guy? Now, become a, I say to people, use the five count, go to my website, go to my YouTube channel, use the five count, become a come better, set the dice and try to throw them in the same way. And they, you can do it there. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll never forget the look in that guy's face. I had no yes, idea sir. what I was doing. I've never done that. I've never bet don't pass since. But I always wondered if it was a good bet or not. And you're telling me there's essentially no difference. It's very interesting. At the top of your game, Dominic, how good were you? In this uh, documentary, Breaking Vegas, they have you calling out your shots. I know it was dramatized. But was it kind of like that in your heyday? Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember we did another TV show for uh, the travel station. And uh, the name of the show that I wrote was What Would You Do If? What it was all about was the theme of the show, uh, the hour show, when uh, travel station did a lot of different things on casinos in Vegas, was, you know, what, it, what would you do if you found a $100 chip on the floor of a casino? Would you keep it? Or would you turn it in? And then uh, we'd ask people, and uh, and then we'd go to the gaming commission and what the actual law is, rule is, finding a hundred dollar chip on the floor. Well, during the filming of that show, uh, you know, the people, the director, producer, cameraman, you know, they just didn't believe what I could do and about dice control. And we were at the Golden Nugget, and we were doing a, a thing at the table, like, what would you do if you got overpaid at a crap game? You know, and what what is the rule? To that anyway my partner said okay you guys don't believe it you know here we go let's film it Dom and I said okay guys what number you want me to throw and uh, you know somebody yelled out five and I said how do you want it three two four one uh, three two bang three two what's the next number nine five four well I did that four times in a row wow and then I just stopped and it was filmed and everything else like that I believe and this goes back to what we talked about earlier. Uh, my sister has passed away at a, at a pretty young age. I believe that um, she's on my shoulder. And whenever I got to do something like that or prove something or something, she's my guardian angel. And, uh, but, you know, when you, when you become a dice controller and you, and you can verify your edge, and you can verify your edge mathematically whether or not you uh, have an edge to beat the house. We have a software on our website called SmartCrafts where you put in your rolls and it'll actually do the calculation for you on what your edge is when you're throwing the dice. Or you can do it manually uh, by with a simple thing we call the SRR, sevens to roll ratio. Uh, you can calculate what your edge is when you when you are throwing the dice. And so you know whether or not you're you're good or not. But and as you become better and better and better, it really becomes amazing. My students will say this and everything else that as soon as the dice leave your hands, you know whether or not it's a good shot or not, because you can see are they together in the air? They feel right coming off your fingers. All that good stuff like that. And so, so many times 
even, you know, today, I can throw the dice and here comes the six. I know it's a six. I know there's going to be a six. And that happens not just to me, but, you know, some of my better students. Because you practice so much, you can feel it. I mean, it's like a ball player, basketball player. Um, you know, Michael Jordan, when he, you know, released uh, the ball, you know, he could almost know it was going to go in the hoop. Uh, Tiger Woods uh, making a putt. You know, as soon as he stroke it, he knew that he was on the right line and it was going to go in. And if it didn't, it was like, oh, man, by just a quarter of an inch, you know, lift the puck or so, lift, the, lift the hole or something. So as a dice controller, because it is an athletic endeavor, you're going to know the more you practice whether or not you've just thrown a good shot or not. And so, um, yeah, those calling out numbers, that show depicted that, and that truly did happen at Treasure Island where I called out the hard ten. That whole episode uh, was all true. That's got to be such a terrific feeling when you're in the zone yeah, like what? that, and you you release them, and you know chips are coming back to you. I mean, that's got to feel good. Yeah, it does. Winning is the most fun. Yeah, I want to rush like that one day. I certainly do, and I'm going to take <laughs> some of your tips. Listen, i got to ask you, because you brought it up, what do you do when you find a $100 chip on the floor and when you get overpaid at the craps table? <laughs> when I find a $100 chip on the floor, it goes into my pocket. <laughs> when I get over, and that's actually not the law. You're supposed to turn that in, by the way. And let's take that to a slot machine before I go to the crap table thing. Let's say you go walk up to a slot machine and you see, uh, you know, $2.50. Somebody didn't cash out a two dollars worth of tickets and you play it out that's actually against the law as well but the reason why it's against the law the reason why they've made it against the law is the casino doesn't really care you find a hundred dollar chip you put in your pocket or you have 250 on a on a slot machine you play it out what they're doing that for is for vagrants there are people you know god forbid you know people that are just homeless and you know out of a job or whatever uh, they'll walk through casinos and looking for that, that dollar on the slot machine and cash out that ticket and go cash it in. They they don't want, you know, vagrants, homeless, you know, walking around the casino and disturbing people and whatever. Uh, that's why those laws are there, uh, by the way. At a, at a crap table, when it happens to me and I get overpaid, I actually tell the casino or I tell the dealer, hey, you overpaid me. Uh, I always feel that a uh, good turn deserves another and so that 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 good thing is going to come back to me you know i had <laughs> uh, somebody bought uh one of my dvds and i gave him a deal this just happened a couple days ago actually well i'm in the process i've been busy and everything else like that and i forgot to send him a paypal invoice for 50 dollars. you know uh just yesterday and this happened about a week ago i was said okay i'm going to ship it out i'm going to send you a paypal invoice for 50 bucks just yesterday he sends me an email he says i got the dvd you never sent me an invoice and I thought to myself, man, what an honest guy. So I write him back and I said, thank you very much. Uh, I just sent you an invoice for $40 because you're such a good guy. And reminded me that I, you know, I would have totally forgot. I swear to God, I would have forgot about it. So, you know, a good turn deserves another. Being honest is the way to go. Finding that chip on the floor, I mean, you bring it into security. What the hell are they going to do? They're going to give it back to the casino. And the casinos are there to take every nickel and dime out of you. But, you know, if a dealer makes a mistake and if that gets caught up on top, you know, that could hurt his reputation, his job, his, you know, just, uh, you know, his livelihood. So I'm going to tell him, sir, you know, hey, pal, and they usually call him by their first name. Hey, Jim, you know, you overpaid me here. Oh, thank you very much. Now, that can come right back at me, you know, by uh, moving aside when I'm throwing the dice instead of blocking or you know, trying to annoy me when I'm picking up the dice and throwing them, you know, and I, I look at that the same way as I look at when I tip at the at the crap table or when I tip at the blackjack table, you know, it just uh, comes back at you. You know, I, I believe in that wholeheartedly, and I don't want to get too much into tilt here, but, you know, when you get those negative thoughts, when you get tired, when you think, oh, the guy's yep. going to hit his card or something, that's the time to stop because that's when negative gets in. You want to play Absolutely. in that free-spirited, positive environment where you think, hey, I'm going to hit my card. I'm not going to roll a seven on this throw. Everything is going. You want to play in that kind of mind frame. Let's talk about the website, goldentouchcraps.com. I mean, this is a remarkable resource for the game. There's so much on there. Dice control training seminars, private dice control lessons, 
Uh, you sell craps tables, practice tables, yep. books, videos, DVDs, articles, thousands of them. There's a community yep. forum. I mean, what's your goal with Golden Touch Craps? Remarkable website for the game. My goal is really to make everybody an advantage player. You know, going to a casino is fun. Going to Las Vegas or any resort, uh, Atlantic City or a local casino or you're, you know, in Canada, Win Windsor Casino or something, it's a lot of fun. They usually have great restaurants and and they'll usually bring in a, a star as a show, uh, that sort of thing. It's a lot of fun. But I don't want you to be a loser. I believe that just with a little, I know, I shouldn't say I believe, I know that just with a little bit of practice, just a little bit of practice, you can gain an edge over the casino in certain games. And the other games you want to eliminate. You just don't want to play them, the games that you can't get an edge at. You know, you can learn, if you're a slot player, you can learn video poker very easily. You can get video poker cards off the web, off a person's website. Uh, the right strategy, if you, you know, what to hold and what not to hold. And you can ha hold that card in your hand. And when that comes up on the machine, this is what you hold. This is what you draw to. If you don't want to learn how to count cards, get a basic strategy card. You know, with a basic strategy card, you're, you're going to be playing with a negative only half a percent edge. So you're playing with just a negative half a point. So if you get lucky and you get your double downs and you make your double downs and you make your splits, you're going to become a winner. But if not, you're only playing at a negative half a point instead of making any kind of guesswork at it. Same thing with craps, as I just said to you, even without reading books or my books or anything else like that. Become a combatter, pick the dice up, set them hard ways, throw them gently, and then everybody else use the five count. Right. If you just do that, you'll be better. Simple but advice. Stay away from the carnival games. Stay away from the three-card poker games and the... Uh, uh, roulette or all these other games that there's no way that you can beat. And that's what my objective is with my website and my seminars and my books. It's just, this is a lot of fun going to casinos. Let's, let's just throw the math right back at the casino's face and try to beat them. Why play stupid games when you can play games that you have a shot of beating or at least bring the edge down to almost nothing? Beat the craps out of the casinos, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I got a, <laughs> I, I got a couple more questions. The website again sure. is goldentouchcraps.com. I want to talk about the three top rolls of all time. But first, you know, online gambling sites and the proliferation of online. I mean, you can play at your computer, in your pajamas. You can play on yeah. your phone. I'm wondering what you think of the proliferation of online gambling sites and specifically online craps. It kind of takes the throw rate right out of it. Uh, it does, and you can't beat the game. You know, I, I, an advantage. You want to become an advantage player, even if you're just doing it recreationally, and you go to a casino only twice a year. Why not be an advantage player? And so, any of those games online, you know, I, you won't see me ever playing them. You know, I'll play uh, when I used to play a lot of poker online. Uh, you know, that's an entirely different story. Uh, but any of these other games, I'm not going to play because you can't beat it. So why am I? I say in class, why are you putting your hard-earned money on the line and gambling it away when you could do something where you can at least get a little bit of an edge or play a 50-50 game? You're pissed off at your boss. You're pissed off at getting up early. You're going to work. You make your, you're making this money to support your family and everything else, and then you're just going to gamble it away? Well, that's ridiculous. If you want to have a little bit of entertainment, learn how to play the game and beat them. Well, you can't do that with online gambling. You can't do that with online blackjack. You can't count those cards. In craps, you, you don't have control over the dice. It's just a random roll. You're just playing a stupid game that carries with it a 13% edge. I mean, that's ridiculous. Giving the bank 100 bucks, and 10 seconds later, you know, they're only going to give you back 87 of it when you're talking about, uh, you know, a 13% edge. Uh, so, yeah, uh, online gambling. No way, uh, craps or anything else like that. When it comes to sports or when it comes to poker, different story. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to casino games, uh, you don't want to do that. Well, that's another thing you do on your website. You make some sports picks. I certainly do. I have a great, uh, you know, I'm pretty good at what I do. I use uh, a lot of statistical uh, analysis, a lot of uh, 
programs that I've written. You know, again, I'm a software developer by trade and stuff. So, you know, I, I can pretty much predict the outcome pretty close to everything. I mean, yesterday we went 2-1 uh, and one on the playoff games um, in football in the NFL. So, uh, the only game we lost was uh, we had Seattle straight up, and uh, they had a shot at winning and covering. Uh, the line was uh, four plus four, and they wound up losing by five. They missed a two-point conversion, or else that would have been a winner. We would have swept the board. So, yeah, I've been doing it for 30 years, and uh, I have clients that pay me for my picks, and uh, they all make a lot of money doing it. Folks, you want to check out the website. It's goldentouchcraps.com. Now, the reason I reached out to you, Dominic, is about uh, this uh, granny in the groove, the greatest role ever, Stanley yeah. Fujitaki second, and then there's this guy called the captain who came in at third. But you talk about legendary status. These three players have it. I mean, I got to figure there was so much luck involved, but still, oh, were. these were these were unbelievable roles, weren't they? Well, yeah. Well, Patricia DeMarco, I actually, we actually interviewed her. I actually interviewed her. I her, had her come to one of my seminars and talk to her. And I actually, I was interviewed by the New York Times and the Boston Globe about her role at uh, uh, the Borgata in Atlantic City. And I can tell you that the Borgata in Atlantic City was very, very lucky that day because uh, they went up to a table. They went up to a table where most of the players, in fact, Almost 100% of the players at that table were just $100 or $200 buy-ins, meaning completely recreational players. Right. Uh, Patricia didn't increase her $12, 6 and 8 because that's what she did. Didn't increase her $12, 6 and 8 until 45 minutes into the roll. Now, a regular craps player would have taken that casino uh, for the amount of money that the whole table took him for, which was $700,000. A regular craps player would have won $700,000 without even blinking an eye. But as I said to uh, the New York Times and the people that interviewed me about that role, is that, yeah, there was an awful lot of luck involved. She threw sevens. They just came out at the right time, meaning she just made her point of six, and then she threw a seven. She would have thrown that seven right hand one roll before the, the game is over. So, yeah, she threw a lot of sevens. In fact, she never played craps before in her life. She was there with her boyfriend, and she wanted to play, and he gave her $100, and she bought into the table and got the dice and just went absolutely bananas. Uh, the same thing with those other guys, except for the captain. You know, the captain was a dice controller. But I even say in, in dice control to my students that they have any kind of a long roll, you need a little bit of luck on a roll. And I relate that to DiMaggio's 56-game uh, hitting streak. You know, some of those shots that were considered a hit, and were a hit, actually, were just a half an inch away from the shortstop glove. In other words, a half an inch one way or another, and it would have been an out. You know, so even in his 56-game hitting streak, there was some luck involved. And the same thing happens here with Dice. When you're a dice controller, not every shot is going to be the perfect shot. Sometimes I, those dice come off my fingers, and I and I say, and I'll yell at the table, get lucky, meaning this is a bad shot, and I'll be lucky if it doesn't throw, if it doesn't show a seven. And so when it doesn't show a seven, I feel very lucky on that shot because most of the time, when that ha when that type of shot comes out of my hands, it's a seven. I mean, you know, one finger was lower, I, whatever happened, you know, my concentration left me, whatever the case is, I can tell that a seven is coming, and I'll yell at the table, get lucky. So yeah, all those shots, all those monster rolls that we talked about had a lot of luck involved in it. The seven did show. It's uh, it's just that they came at the right time. You're Even telling my hour rolls, my hour and a half rolls that I've had. I mean, there were some bad shots in there that I just got lucky on. I hit a chip, and instead of being a seven out, you know, it turned out to be a number. So, um, yeah. It's interesting that you say the casino got lucky that night. You're telling me that if you were there, you would have walked away uh, with close to a million bucks. Oh, absolutely. Any crap player, even if you were just a a three hundred dollar buy in. I mean, you know, once you got some money, I mean, like I said, she had a twelve dollar six and eight. She didn't increase, and nobody increased that twelve dollars to an eighteen dollars six and eight, and she was rolling for forty-five minutes. I mean, come on, man! You know, after ten minutes, 
you know, somebody who's a place better or even somebody who's a come better starts off with two time odds. It's going to go to five time odds and increase the $10 baseline come bet to maybe a $15 or $25. Yeah, I mean, she just went absolutely bananas. <laughs> and somebody like myself or a, cra a regular craps player would have walked away from that casino with a half a million to a million bucks on that roll. Wow. That's why they were lucky. Everybody didn't know how to play the game. It was a it was a table they opened up, not in the crap pit. It was somewhere else in Borgata. I haven't been in Borgata a long time, so I can't really tell you where it was. But it's somewhere where it was all by itself and the, the the casino was jammed and they just and the craps tables were jammed and they decided to open up another table and it was away from the craps pit. So it was just people that would just walk in, hey, let me you know there to have a good time on a Saturday night or Friday night, whenever it was. And that's why they would just, you know, pop down a hundred bucks, pop down $200 and ask the dealer, what should I do? Uh, you know, give me $12 and place to six. You know, everybody was not a craps player. Nobody knew anything about the game. I'm wondering about table. this idea of a lucky shooter. Uh, you talked about the five rule. You know, when the dice is out of your hands, is it an important part of the game to spot the lucky thrower or you just take that right out of the equation? Yeah, you got to take that away. You just, it, like, I, like I'm saying, you just utilize the five count. You know, just because a person had a good role, it doesn't mean the next time they're going to have a good role. And it doesn't mean that if you see people setting the dice, that they're dice controllers either. You don't know if they've been practicing or what they are. I've sold an awful lot of my books, and a lot of people have watched my videos. You know, and people try this. On random rollers, you give everybody the you do the five count on everybody, which is basically waiting five rolls before you make a bet, and um, uh, and then try to do it yourself by setting and throwing in a controlled way. He gave us some great simple advice here. You got to visit the yeah. website for more advanced stuff. It's GoldenTouchCraps.com. Really appreciate this. What a pleasure. The Dominator Dominic Loriggio, craps great, and a guy who's led the Golden Touch Dice Revolution. Dominic, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, Derek.